Welcome back. My name is Joel Duff, and here I'm going to do an episode of Critiquing Creationism. You know, I'm always looking for articles to include in my ongoing series, This Week in Creationism, where we take a look at the, you know, the most recent things that are happening in the world of young age or young earth creationism. But I bumped into two articles, one on Answers in Genesis and one on Creation Ministries uh, International's website, creation.com that were so closely related to each other and had such a similar theme that I wanted to explore that particular theme, right? And the theme is, what should creationists do or how should they think about conspiracy theories? Basically, they're both articles warning their audience, their audience being, you know, followers of young earth creationism, to be wary of conspiracy, you know, right? conspiracies and conspiracy promoters. Now, what's interesting here is they both picked up on the same example to use for uh, of a conspiracy theory. That conspiracy being that man never really landed on the moon, that, that people have never been on the moon itself, despite pictures like this picture here of an astronaut that looks like he's standing on the moon with this American flag waving and there's his little lander. Right? There are many folks who uh, doubt that this historical event actually occurred. In other words, now, I'm, wanting to, I'm just going to go through, pick out a few highlights from both of these articles. I'm going to start with the Answers in Genesis article because it's a much more substantive. Um, but, and then I'll show how the Creation Ministries International um, article uh, reiterates a lot of the same points, but has a few extra little tidbits that we want to throw in. All right, so this is, this is about what should, you know, how should we react to conspiracy theories? Okay, let's dive right in. Did man really land on the moon? You see, this is from July 20th of this year, and this is Rob Webb who's written this. Rob Webb is a fairly recent hire of Answers in Genesis, I think 2021. He is or does have a degree in aerospace engineering, and he worked for NASA for, I think, about 10 years. So he has some legit creds in terms of working for a space agency. So taking on the topic of did man really land on the moon, you know, it was right up his alley. Since coming to Answers in Genesis, he's doing a bunch of writing, doing a bunch of speaking, uh, you know, sort of daily speaking at the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum. So did man really land on the moon? Well, let's dispense with the beginning. This is just sort of a background on the history of the, the history of the historical events all right, uh, that brought the U.S. to the point of landing a man on the moon on July 20th, uh, 1969. And so he then brings us right down to, hey, look, most people don't doubt that the Apollo astronauts actually landed on the moon. Okay, so we get to this point where he finally says, after this description, so you might be wondering why bother writing an article to address this question. After all, pretty much everyone in the world knows the Apollo missions really happened, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, no. Recently, especially over the last year or so, I've been meeting more and more people, including many Christians at the Creation Museum and Ark Encounter, who actively promote this moon landing conspiracy, saying to me something like, humans have never set foot on the moon's surface. There's evidence that proves that the Apollo missions didn't actually happen. The moon landings were faked by NASA. I don't spend much time on social media, but I've heard these moon landing conspiracies are rampant all over various platforms, which means many people have also likely heard this, these claims. So that's interesting. Where is he hearing about this moon conspiracy? He's hearing it from people who are coming in to see the Ark Encounter and the Creation Museum, right? He's speaking there, interacting with, with folks, uh, and they're asking all kinds of questions about young earth creationism, a global flood, dinosaurs, whether they lived with human beings, right? All those kind of classic questions that come along with young age creationism. At the same time, he's hearing an intermixing of people talking about, yeah, well, you can't trust the government either. You know, NASA, we, you know, they just made that up, us landing on the moon. We've never really done that before, right? And he, having worked for NASA, understandably realizes this is, this is not right. And so he has a concern. And his concern, and by the way, it's the same concern I have. Here's my concern. There seems to be an increasing number of Christians who have brought into, bought into this moon landing conspiracy. And it doesn't seem to be slowing down anytime soon. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me at all if at least one moon landing denier existed in just about every large church in America today. His perception is that this is a growing concern, right? This is a, this is a growing conspiracy 
a distrust in um, the official narrative, I guess you could say, the accepted public narrative of, of historical events. As Christians, it's important we always model, promote, and speak the truth, not spreading lies nor slander about others. We'll come back to that later. I will too. Uh, that's why I'm motivated to put together this article, especially addressing Christians, right? He's addressing Christians who are falling for this particular conspiracy. There are many outside of uh, Christian that uh, have fallen for this particular conspiracy. So this isn't a Christian only sort of conspiracy um, uh, event, but it is infiltrating, right? <laughs> Christian circles at a great rate. And I would say infiltrating uh, the young earth creationist community at a much faster rate than it would be in the, the, the general Protestant Christian evangelical community. And why might that be? Maybe it's because the same language that is used by conspiracy theorists it are sometimes overlap a lot with the types of arguments and especially that people like Answers in Genesis are using, right? At the Creation Museum and at the Ark Encounter, they're using the same kind of uh, rhetoric, same kind of arguments uh, that are easily applied to uh, sweeping people up into a lot of other conspiracies. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. All right, so note, he is discovering this conspiracy through what he believes are Christians who are coming to learn about young earth creationism. And they are also taking in these other conspiracies. Now the Creation Ministries International um, article is, also talks about this moon landing conspiracy being a problem within young earth creationist circles, but also goes on to, to mention a number of other conspiracies that are also running rampant within young earth creationist, uh, the young earth creationist community. So where does this come from? You might be wondering, where did all this interest in moon landing conspiracies even come from? Is this a novel thing? Well, of course, conspiracies aren't novel at all. In fact, these conspiracy theories have persisted for decades, right, all the way back to the Apollo days, the 1970s, and this wouldn't be necessarily young earth creationists who are developing this conspiracy, or even Christians that are developing this, this particular conspiracy. It already existed, right? It's in the, it's in the milieu, right, of our, of our, of our conversation. Um, so then he points out, hey, reasons for conspiracies typical vary, but for the most part, I believe a lot of them stem from the lack of trust in the U.S. government. Now, so here's, here's his take on the origins of many conspiracies, and that is we don't trust, you know, our elected officials. We don't trust our government, or we don't, expect a, we don't trust our government agencies. Uh, and, you know, I would say that, you know, this is where Answers in Genesis and Ken Ham in particular uses the same kind of, of um, the same kind of technique of creating distrust in order to create doubt. All right. So, for example, he talks about seminaries or cemeteries, right? You know, where, where the, the more a Christian goes to be educated about how to understand the Bible, the less they actually know, all right? You can't trust, you know, seminarians. You know, they come up with all these different theories about how to how to interpret the scriptures in different ways than just the plain reading, which to, to Ken Ham is the obvious way that, should, that the Bible should be read, right? They, they ultimately, he's, he's, he's ascribing conspiracy to, um, you know, that there's this whole, you know, enterprise that is trying to undermine Christians, even though these are supposedly Christians that are that are building seminaries and training others to to uh, interpret and understand scripture and to be able to preach and teach uh, that. So, all right, but I, w I, I will agree generally, and let me just say that I'm going to agree with most everything in this article. This is a, a well-written article on Answers in Genesis website, and his, their followers would be um, well advised to follow the advice that Rob Webb is going to present in this particular article. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult for some of the followers of Answers in Genesis to take this advice because it's really kind of hard to parse like how do I take this advice but not apply it to some of the things that Answers in Genesis says that we really do need to believe. Uh, and uh, Rob Webb's not, if, if I remember this article right, is not going to um, necessarily create a distinction you know, like, why should you believe us, but uh, not believe all these other uh, stories that you've heard? 
Uh, but the, the, the Creation Ministries International um, article will be a little more precise in terms of why young earth creationism is not a conspiracy, all right? Uh, because they believe that it is well supported by the facts and so forth, all right? And, and it's necessary because the, Bible's de the Bible demands it, whereas uh, the Bible doesn't demand that you believe that we never landed on the moon, all right? There's no, no scriptural reference to, to suggest that either we can't actually go to the moon, all right? That, that, that's, that's not allowed somehow for human beings and therefore it couldn't have happened, or that it simply says that it tells us that man will never be on the moon and can't be on the moon. Um, right? Scriptures don't say that. All right. So then what do we have? How do we determine whether man has been on the moon or not? Well, we determine it from the physical evidence, right? The, the reports, uh, the, the video, the, re, the, the, the eyewitness <laughs> reports, the individuals that actually were on the moon and said they were. All right. All those things collectively we use today since, you know, many of us weren't there to actually see it happen or have firsthand knowledge. Um, those things are left for us as artifacts, all right, of a historical event that we can interpret and understand to be a real historical event. Uh, it goes on to an explanation about how we lost trust in the government, you know, the Vietnam War and so forth. And yes, I think they're, they're, these are not, uh, these are valid um, historical rationales for why p fewer and fewer people have trust in governments today, not just the U.S. government, but governments in general. So Rob asked a really good question here. What exactly is the motivation for denying moon landing? Especially from, you know, like from a Christian perspective, why feel like you need to deny the fact that man has landed on the moon? Um, you know, again, he says, I believe that at least part of the reason comes back to lack and trust of the government. But actually, if we take a step back, look at the big picture, people in general seem to be naturally attracted to conspiracy theories. <laughs> Absolutely. Regardless of their actual feelings toward government agencies with itching ears that just can't seem to get enough of the latest conspiracies floating around. You know, I mean, how many different channels and different, uh, uh, you know, blog sites and Twitter accounts and Facebook accounts are dedicated to exposing and I don't mean exposing, like denying conspiracies, but exposing people to conspiracies. I would say that for the most part, people normally just chat about these conspiracies in casual conversations with others, not really taking them too seriously. I agree. A lot of people just like to talk about conspiracies. It's, it's more fun to talk about than reality a lot of times, right? Because it's more interesting to think about what, 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 what could have happened or what could happen or what might be true that seems more interesting than the actual reality itself. Sometimes reality is boring. Uh, and we want something a little bit more than reality, which is probably why artificial intelligence images and stories and videos and all things are, are end up being getting more attraction more attraction on social media than real images of actual plants and animals and physical things right uh, because the more outlandish the more interesting but it's true many people are just you know, it's, it's casual talk and you still like have some basis in reality it's like yeah okay yeah, yeah I, I suppose that could be true but i don't really believe if, if if you held a gun to my head right if you if you like made me like commit to something and swear to something, I'm probably not going to swear that uh, you know that there, nobody ever landed on the moon. But there are true believers, right? And the more they can get individuals to have doubts, right? The more you have doubts about something like that, and you doubt something else, the more confused you are about the reality of historical events. The more then there's an opportunity for you to get believe something else that maybe is their alternative, uh, you know, maybe that's their real reason for creating doubt, sowing doubt. Confusion creates doubt. Doubt creates the inability to take a strong position on real true things because you underneath wonder whether it's really true or not. All right, then he goes on to talk about the flat earth movement, which is also another growing trend among young earth creationists. Uh, we also have some famous um, celebrities who have taken on sort of a flat earth flair, right? And whether they're just doing it to create attention, all right? And whether, if they, again, would they really commit to it if they if they had to? Like, you know, this is nearly life and death, you're gonna, or you're gonna put your entire bank account on, on one of these things. Which one are you gonna take? Probably not gonna take the flat earth. Um, but nonetheless, 
because they don't deny it, it leads a lot of others to say, well, well, if, if somebody who should be in the know or is rather famous is taking on this particular position, then maybe there's something to it, right? Creating doubt, right? Sowing doubts. Um, and then he mentions here uh, a couple of articles that he suggests you read by Danny Faulkner, who is a astronomer who works for Answers in Genesis, who, again, I would recommend his articles. He's written some very good articles about uh, the flat earth, all right, the flat earth conspiracy, and warning Answers in Genesis followers, right, true subscribers, right, not to follow this flat earth thing. Uh, and unfortunately, Danny Faulkner has received a lot of pushback from that. I mean, I've I've seen where, you know, those articles are published on social media and, you know, there are Answers in Genesis, people who love Answers in Genesis who get really upset that uh, they're being told that they shouldn't be believing in a flat earth. Uh, many times because they see the flat earth as being having the same legitimacy as a young earth in terms of the necessity to believe in it, because they think, in this case, a flat earth actually might come from the Bible itself, that there are verses in the Bible that you could interpret as suggesting the world is flat, right, rather than a globe. Uh, and since that is the, as Ken Ham would say, the authoritative word, right, and, you, and we need to take every single word of it absolutely literally um, and, and apply it to our knowledge of the world, they feel like that denying the flat earth then is like denying the scriptures, right? So they're, they're using the same logic in order to, to come to the same kind of conclusion about what they have to believe that Ken Ham has trained them to do. Uh, and so that's been, that's been really interesting to see um, Danny Faulkner's articles, which are, I think are really well written. I think his argumentation is great, right? I mean, he talks about the Bible. He also talks about science. Uh, and shows how ridiculous a flat earth, the flat earth belief is. All right. Um, but nonetheless, uh, all of his arguments very much in my mind, in fact, uh, on my blog and, and several others have written articles showing that um, if you take Danny Faulkner's words about a flat earth and simply replace them with, you know, a young age, you know, creation, um, the same logic works to sort of undermine the, the necessity of a, of a young aged earth as well. All right. And I think some of his, their, you know, young answers and Genesis followers are get confused in this manner because they have been so trained to think in a certain way that it makes them very susceptible to these kind of uh, conspiracy theories. Now, I am not going to equate, you know, I'm not saying young age creationism is the same as a flat earth uh, conspiracy theory. All right. Um, I think that there's, there's worlds of differences uh, between the two, but the, the point here is, is that many people within the world of young earth creationism, many followers of young earth creationism do find it very difficult to distinguish. You know, I, you're telling us that, uh, uh, you know, that, um, well, here's how, the, here's how it goes often, All right? We're already being told, Ken Ham already talks about how it, it is kind of a vast conspiracy, that evolution is a vast conspiracy of tens of thousands of scientists who've been trained a certain way and who are all trying to hide the truth that evolution is completely, you know, uh, bunk, right? Or that the world is young, right? The world is only 6,000 years old. And here you have thousands of scientists who uh, have produced all this effort and a lot of it's government funded stuff, right? And so here's the government funding all these people and they only fund people to get the types of results they want. Right? It's all a big conspiracy to make sure we don't see the clear evidence that the world is young. So to so the way Ken Ham's apologetic is, right, his method of arguing for a young earth leads people into this very much in this mindset of the entire world is trying to everyone outside of my little clique, right, that knows the truth, right, that, that has the, the absolute truth of the age of the world. Everyone else is in denial of that and is intentionally trying to obscure all evidence that would suggest what is clearly shown by the by if you don't if the scales fall away from your eyes, you can clearly see that the world is young. Right. That is in a way, Kenham used very much conspiracy type language about how young earth creation and creationism is being um, 
is being um, blocked, all right, from the real truth. And this is the same thing that if you believe that man never walked on the moon, well, you're going to have to say that uh, a bunch of people in NASA, right, different government agencies and private, you know, groups that helped out all know that we never walked on the earth, but they're all so afraid of, of whatever it is that would, whatever consequence there would be f to the fact that we've never been there. They're all, we're all hiding it, right? That's a huge conspiracy that thousands of people, people are involved in this conspiracy to, to cover up the evidence, right? To hide the evidence. And so thousands of people are hiding the evidence for the, a young age of the world too. Right, so, it's, so the mindset is not that dissimilar. And so young earth creationists have a challenge here, uh, which that's why I'm highlighting these two articles. And, and this isn't, these aren't the first two. There's been quite a few articles over the last five, six years by young earth creationist groups warning Christians to, stress, to stay away and what's wrong with all these other conspiracy theories. But in a way, they are creating an environment that, that is a, a very, uh, you know, it's like a, it's, it's, it's an environment conducive to conspiracy theory generation and spread. All right, All right I got slowed down here. Um, so this is about flat earth. We don't need to do that. What's the underlying cause? What's the real cause? All right, so there's, so there's, a dis, you know, there's distrust in governments, distrust in scientists in general, distrust in authorities all right, outside the Christian church. And even within creationist circles, there's, you know, a lot of distrust among other Christians, right? Especially most Christian leaders, since they're mostly not young earth creationists. And so even they are in, in on the conspiracy to um, distract us from the real evidence for a young earth. So what is it? I believe it's the lure of so-called secret knowledge. Now, this has been written about by many people. Uh, it's, it's kind of a common theme among when you talk about uh, conspiracy theories that um, our human nature is such that we we do love to know something other people don't. Isn't it feel good to like I understand or know something or I have secret information, I have secret knowledge, I have some facts that you don't have? Gives you kind of a feeling of power, right? Gives you a feeling of privilege. Like I know things that you don't know. Right. And so, especially if it's like, you know, all of you think one thing, but I actually know differently and I'm right. Um, that's, a, that's a really good feeling. It makes one feel like if it makes you feel important, right? It does, really does make you feel important. And I'm not just the, I'm not just the average, like, hey, everyone believes that. There's nothing special about that, but I have this thing that they don't know about. All right, he's gonna go on and talk about Gnosticism as, as a particular example. I think it's a decent example, but let's, let's move on down here. As an analogy, if you remember back to our childhood days, it's like a friend who always bragged, I know something you don't know, right? We've all wanted to do that. We've all wanted to have some little bit of knowledge that nobody else has. And then we kind of hold on to that secret because the longer we keep the secret sometimes, the more we feel like we have some power. But of course, we also want to share the secret, right? Because if you don't ever share the secret, it's like, I can't really prove that I know something you don't know and you can't like, you know, you would give me more props, right? If, if I, if I then shared it with you. And that's the thing about conspiracies, right? So you're like, yeah, I got all this secret information. I want everybody to know, except that once everybody knows it's not so special anymore, right? If you were to convert the whole world into like, okay, everybody in the world doesn't believe that we land on the moon. It's like, well, what's the purpose? What, what, what good was that? You know what, you know, I'm no, and everybody's in on the secret now. It's not so special. Right? The drive that many conspiracists have is this, 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 this understanding or feeling or real belief that they have something that nobody else has. Did you catch it, catch it at the heart of this attraction to secret knowledge is simply this, pride. I personally know quite a few people who fall into this category, deriving much of their self-pride or self-worth by having a sense of ability to supposedly discover things that other people don't know. Right. I can learn. I can know something you don't know. Right. And therefore, you need to I mean, you need to look up to me. Right. You need to believe me and not these other people. Consequently, their pride effectively keeps them trapped in a fictional reality of make believe ideas. 
I've also noticed that once people are immersed deep enough in one of these strange conspiracies, it's nearly impossible to pull them out. I mean, all of you have experienced this. Somebody who's deep into a conspiracy, it doesn't matter how many facts you have. Facts aren't going to change their mind. You know, your arguments are not really aren't going to change your mind if you're simply just like attacking them with like, here, here, here's some data, right? This will shake you out of it. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of, a lot of similarities to, you know, um, talking to a young earth creationist. You're not going to convince a young earth creationist um, who, who knows young earth creationism that they're wrong simply by pounding them with a bunch of, well, what about this? What about this? What about this scientific data? And, and I know half of you are screaming at me going like, yeah, but you, you make videos all the time about evidence for an old earth and like comparison critiques, right? This is critiquing creationism, You're critiquing creationism, and often it's critiques of uh, scientific errors or scientific misconceptions. Uh, isn't your desire that, um, that people are going to suddenly change their mind because you've convinced them? No, I, I don't, I'm not under illusions that a young earth creationist who's well into that worldview is going to hear arguments about like, well, you know, yes, there is this evidence for this way of understanding radiometric dating, or whatever, and this is, you know, contrary to what you think. And they're going to be like, wow, I never thought of it that way. I think I'm going to change my mind. No, that's, that's, that's not really going to happen. Um, this requires uh, the replacement of the core, like, rationale for being a young creationist, which is all about, you know, an interpretation of scriptures. Um, you have, you'd have to have a replacement for that and for building a real personal relationship and understanding in order to get somebody to... Um, be willing to explore, all right, different um, different models, all right, different ways of understanding the world, different ways of understanding origins, but still under the context of trying to be faithful to scriptures, uh, and that doesn't just happen overnight, right? That that's a long conversation uh, and working with people. The same way with anybody within any conspiracy theory. Um, just saying they're wrong and you need to like, you know, snap out of it. It's kind of like depression, right? If somebody who actually has clinical depression, you got to like, well, just stop being depressed, right? Start to, you know, just think happy thoughts and it'll all be better, right? It's, it's not that simple. It never is. Um, yeah, so he's right. I mean, this, and, and, and at the root of that is sometimes a pride issue, right? This feel like if I give this up, then I'm no longer special. I no longer have something nobody else. I, and I'm going to have to admit that I'm wrong about this and that you were right. And you know, that's hard for people to do. It's hard for me to do. There's very few people who find it easy to go like, yeah, I was, I was completely wrong about this thing that was like, was very central to my core being, which young earth creationism very much is. It's very much a part of that one's identity. You know, I got somebody just to give up their identity just like that. Um, now, giving up, this particular thing, like man walked on the moon or didn't, doesn't seem like it quite hits to the core of someone's identity. But, you know, there are people that are so into it that, again, it, it, you, you're going to hurt someone's pride if they have to admit that they are wrong. No matter how many indisputable facts you present to them, they hastily dismiss it and remain unconvinced. Sure. Um, all right. So then he goes through all the popular evidences for moon landing concerns. So he is going to, like, Let's talk about like what are the arguments for uh, the moon landing. So what are the first five? All right, so he goes through the way the, the flag waving in the wind, which is like the one that's mentioned the most often. And like, why is there this little pole going across here? Well, that's because it's holding it up because there's no gravity there. Uh, and then why does it look like it's moving? Well, I mean, somebody just touched it and it's shaking still, and there's no gravity to uh, stop that shaking. Um, anyway. We don't need to go over these, right? Missing stars in the photos, any photographer would know why that's the case. Um, shadows aren't parallel. Again, you know, that's another misunderstanding. Uh, you know, how did they get there? It's not really possible for people to survive the trip to the moon because of this particular radiation belt. Um, and his responses to these are excellent. I mean, really, I'm not going to find, you're not going to find much better responses out there on the internet by anybody to this particular conspiracy. Right. He's written a very good uh, debunking of the moon landing uh, conspiracy. And then he says, hey, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other things. 
there's memes flying around. There's all kinds of other evidences that are mentioned but aren't sort of like your top five evidences. All of them have the same kind of problems too. But you can get overwhelmed because people just continue to, you know, if somebody who really knows the, the hoax, knows the conspiracy well, they're going to just keep throwing one thing after another. Oh, okay, well, all right, maybe that could answer that, but what about this? But what about this? But what about this? But what about this? What about this? And unfortunately, that's the way a lot of conversations can feel, even over legit questions. Um, you, know, you know, I've been hit with that same type of thing. It's the same kind of reaction I get to posting something. You know, I post some, what I think is a fairly articulate argument, and then you get uh, somebody who responds that barely even, you know, mentions anything you're ready to write. But what about this? I, I, hey, you can't answer where the original self came from. So therefore, whatever you said here doesn't really matter. It even had nothing to do with the origin of life. Or, you know, and then just, well, then if you, you try to answer that, well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? Well, what about this? What about this? Right? It's just, you know, what about? And you're never going to reach the end of the line. There's always going to be the next thing you haven't answered yet. That's not, a, that's not a rational conversation. That's a conversation that's not making any progress. Uh, that's a conversation that includes uh, two people who are not interested in what the other person thinks. They're just doing it for show. That's why I don't engage in those conversations. Like if, I mean, if you're at, if you're gonna if you're gonna make that kind of conversation in the comment section below here, um, you're not gonna get many responses from me. I'll try once. You know, and I you know I'll try once to see if you're gonna make a good faith effort at trying to understand what I'm what I'm saying. And if you're doing that, then I'll try to understand what you're saying. And then we can have an actual conversation in which we are trying to understand each other's positions. Um, but that's not the usual fare on social media in terms of conversation. The biblical standard for establishing this matter. Nonetheless, there is a much more clear cut and biblical method to fully debunking the moon landing conspiracy that should convince most Christians. And this, this is important because he's saying, uh, well, I'm dealing with Christians here, right? He's not saying these aren't Christians who have these conspiracy theories. These are Christians he's concerned about that have these theories. The Bible repeatedly states that two or three witnesses are required as the standard to uh, establish a matter. Then he's going to go on to talk about how, like, look, there were Christians who were part of the moon landing uh, project, right? And they wrote books about what they observed, right? So unless you're saying that these Christians who, who, who seem to be devout and understand some of the, the ethics, right? The ethos of Christianity of being truth tellers and uh, uh, not lying about history, you know, unless you're saying that they're somehow in this conspiracy, they're involved in this conspiracy to cover up the truth, they should be treated as witnesses, right? They are witnesses that we should trust them unless there's a reason not to trust them, right? What, what, you know, and, and just them working for NASA is not a reason not to trust somebody, right? Tens of thousands of people work for the federal government that have many, many different viewpoints and perspectives on things and are individuals and aren't bound to some sort of like, I must protect the government agency, all right? The deep state or whatever, this, 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 mythical thing that is somehow like there's one person in control of everything that somehow everybody's kowtowing to except we can't identify who that individual is or what those specific what that specific group is and through over the past 70 years everybody has been uh keeping these secrets in order to protect the gov the government but the government is made up of thousands and thousands of individuals who aren't all of the same mind um, all right, so his, his basic argument, is, which is a totally valid one, is, look, you have witnesses. And in most enterprises, Mystic Christian enterprises, we have, we have people working for NASA that are Christians, right? And we should ask them to, as honestly as possible, address, you know, assess you know, what, what they know and their, their knowledge, and in fact, in this case, their firsthand knowledge of the event and we shouldn't immediately throw out their word. So she was like, I have all this secondary evidence, I have all these secondary arguments, you know, really just inferences, things that I've made up as possibilities. 
that I have no direct evidence for, and then go and dismiss somebody who has who is an eyewitness to the event and to say, well, oh, well, your 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 voice doesn't matter. I'm going to put all of my secondary pieces of evidence that again, I don't even have I don't even call them pieces of evidence. They're just ideas, right? They're thoughts, possibilities. In other words, weak hypotheses, right? I'm going to take those and I'm going to say those trump your firsthand knowledge. So yeah, people have seen it. We have all kinds of all kinds of individuals and he would even claim we have young earth creationists, right? Which is the epitome of people you should trust, right? I'm sorry, I'm saying that a little sarcastically, but it, it, there's some, you know that the point is for a young earth creationist, there's a, a bit there's a much higher trust level if you're a young earth creationist to like, you know, hey, I found these footprints, I found what I found, you know, this is the evidence I found for a young earth. There's like an instinctual trust of them because, you know, you're all within the same community and you know that the world is against you. And therefore, um, you understand, you know, that, that what we're doing here. Now, some young Earth creationists have grown to become less trustworthy among their creation science colleagues. All right. Because they've been a little bit too exuberant and made up data because we're, we're all sinners. Right. You creation scientists are sinners, too. They have pride. They have they have all the weaknesses of the human flesh. But the point here is, what if there's a young Earth creationist that worked for NASA and saw the evidence and came to the conclusion, yes, we have been to the moon. And Rob Webb would be one of those. <laughs> He's saying, you know, I wasn't there, I'm young, but look, I've worked for NASA, I've talked to people there. Um, I don't see any, I don't see this conspiracy, right? I worked, I was in the system. I was part of the government and I don't see a cover up here. So why should you see a cover up? Um, Christians who claim that NASA faked the moon landing and were never set a foot on the moon are act accusing several Christian brothers of lying about one of the biggest things that have ever happened to them. Right, I was involved in the moon landing. I prepared for it. I watched it on the screen. I talked to those astronauts when they got back about their experiences walking on the moon. And you're saying that I'm lying? That's a big accusation. And you better come with the goods if you're gonna if you're gonna claim a, a, a fellow Christian is lying like that. Bluntly put, Christians who promote this inane moon landing conspiracy need to repent for their lying lips, bearing fault witness, and slandering their fellow brothers in Christ. In case you don't know your Bible, there is just a handful of Bible verses that warn you against these sinful behaviors. Hmm. Okay, here we go. Bunch of verses about lying. Hmm. Yeah, you know, I made a video recently in which I accused Answers in Genesis of lying about a specific fossil uh, and reporting erroneous information about that fossil, leading their audience to believe something that's not true. Uh, and so my words, I, I would say the same line, all right? I would say the same thing to Answers in Genesis. You know, Answers in Genesis, if you promote this particular thing, about this beaver fossil or so-called beaver fossil. I'm asking them to repent or at least change their ways, right? And not bear false witness to other Christians about what is in the fossil record. Uh, more on that later. I'm gonna have another video just about like my use of the word lie and and you know my feelings about answers in Genesis in that matter. All right, so let's get to this conclusion because we had to take a, we'll take a very short look at the other article. Uh, the moon landing was not a hoax. The Apollo missions actually did happen. Men really did put on boots on the lunar surface and returned home safely. And I agree. I think it's absolutely a historical event. Um, I despise this conspiracy theory. Obviously, it's very has some pretty strong feelings about this one, in case you haven't noticed, because it's not only baseless nonsense that undermines one of the greatest achievements in American history, but more importantly, it means falsely accusing Christian brothers of lying about one of the most significant moments in their lives. Yet, sadly, I predict the ones who have dug deep into this conspiracy will likely only dig deeper, refusing to turn away from their falsehood, even after seeing everything in this short article that refutes their make-believe ideas. He's bringing it strong here. Uh, about how he feels about this particular conspiracy theory. And I agree here. Again, as Christians, we have to strive 
to model our Lord by valuing and speaking truth, which means not spreading lies and slander against others. So if you call yourself a Christian and have previously promoted this moon landing hoax story, I pray you've confessed, turned away from sinfulness. Remember God's word says we will judge us for every, God's word says he will judge us for every word we speak. And speaking of God's word, the true history book of the universe in Genesis 1, it says that the moon was created on day four of creation week and the lesser light to rule the night it wasn't made over millions of years by naturalistic processes. It was spoken into existence by our powerful God. So exploring the moon, we're exploring God's creation of the heavens, learning more about his amazing handiwork, basically giving a, a reason why it's okay to go to the moon and find out things about it. We're actually exploring God's world uh, and giving him glory um, for the things that he has made. Thus, Christians need to stop dabbling in these foolish land moon landing conspiracies and instead start being excited for possible opportunities to explore God's creation in the heavens and declare his glory. Um, yeah, so pretty interesting. Answers in Genesis, bringing a very strong, art a strong article um, to their audience to say, like, cut it out. We landed on the moon. Like, you shouldn't be falling for these kinds of conspiracies. Uh, we're going to say it again, right? The mindset of many of those who uh, fall into young earth creationism and, and eat up that literature and really get into the psychology that, that is created by Answers in Genesis. I'm being careful to say Answers in Genesis here and like some of the other big ministries because they have a greater tendency to over-exaggerate their own claims and to create this conspiracy-minded environment. There are other young earth creationists who are sort of outside of these, the ones that I call the new creationists, who are far less prone, far less prone to conspiracy theories. All right, and, and I know for some of you, you may not believe that, but it's absolutely true that they have a far greater appreciation for the complexity of these types of topics. Uh, they don't simply fall for every single story out there. Uh, they're willing to use the evidence and uh, test ideas. Uh, answers in Genesis, not so much. Okay, so here we are on creation.com. That's Creation Ministries International. And it couldn't have been maybe 10 days apart between these two articles, one published on Answers in Genesis, this one published on Creation Ministries International, addressing the same topic, why we reject conspiracy theorizing. And in this case, the moon landings were fake. In other words, a discussion again of like, cut it out. We need to not be believing this moon landing fake thing. But this article goes in a little broader into the idea of conspiracy. So, right, the mooning landings were fake. The U.S. government brought down the World Trade Center. All right, that's one you don't hear as much anymore, but that was pretty popular for a while and has definitely been popular in young earth creationist circles. I, quick side story here. I was in, uh, what was I? I was in Vancouver. Um, and I was at uh, a friend's place, uh, and I had a had a minister that visited. Uh, and uh, you know we're sitting around talking, and so I don't know how the conversation turned around to you know 9/11. This is a number of years back, so we're closer to 9/11. Uh, and um, this pastor went on a long thing about you know, the conspiracy, he gave us all the different evidences for why the World Trade Center was brought down by the U.S. government. It was all an inside job. Uh, and my mind was just totally blown. Not blown in like, you convinced me, just totally blown in like, how did you get to this place? Like, like how did you get this far down the rabbit hole? And you are, you are wrapping up this whole thing of, the government and your distrust of the government and he's in Canada but you know the US government um, but he's also importing that to the Canadian government as well you have distrust it so much that you're wrapping up your Christian message all right and and, and intertwining it with this uh, conspiracy laden thinking really scary to me uh, okay tangent off the earth is flat Right? Alien technology has been discovered and is being kept secret from world governments. Right? Area 51, we really know about all kinds of, in fact, we're exploring technologies there and uh, you know, it's, it's all under wraps. Thousands of people have worked there over you know, 50 years and yet every single one of them, 
I don't know whether they have a non-disclosure agreement that is so strong that nobody's been able to break it. Um, that's the thing about conspiracies. You know, I think that you know somebody once said that if if your conspiracy theory involves um, more than five people that are that are they're the ones that have to hide this secret information, right? Or they know about something that that, that the rest of the government doesn't want you to know. If there's more than five people, then you know that's it's not a true. Theory. It's going to be wrong because once you get more than five people, those people can't keep a secret that long. People are terrible at keeping secrets, right? So if, it, if your conspiracy theory requires you to argue that thousands of people are keeping a secret for years and years and years, especially if it's 20, 30 years, right? Then abandon that conspiracy theory as, you know, turn and run away as fast as you can. Okay, so we don't need to spend a lot of time here. I just want to pick out a couple things. The amount of misinformation circulating in the modern world is staggering, so let us soberly approach this issue. It is our purpose in this article to lay out a path forward for others to follow. Our contention is that we can be faithful to the Bible and science without sacrificing either. I mean, of course, that's their hope. Right? An appeal for scholarship. First and foremost, to our, to our fellow biblical creationists, we implore you to wade more deeply into the waters. We are creationists because both the Bible and the science point us in that direction. Right? So it's like we believe that the Bible says the world's young, and we also believe that science says so too. And let's not go down the whole like circular possible of circular thinking, like you take the Bible and then you reinterpret the science. So of course the science fits the Bible and all that, right? That that's a I'll admit that's kind of a that's something that many people will will immediately say. I think that's also a simplistic overgeneralization of what young earth creationists do and believe. Um, but, so let's set that aside. At the same time, we reject the multiple alternative theories like flat earth because they are supported by neither, right? The Bible doesn't require this. And so first and foremost, we can dismiss a lot of conspiracy theories by simply saying the Bible doesn't actually say anything about this. The Bible doesn't require that you believe this. The Bible doesn't require that you believe that man didn't land on the moon. The Bible doesn't require that you believe in a flat earth. Now, there are some that believe that the Bible does require that, but for most young and creationists, they say no. And I think they have legitimate reasons for, for saying such. I think they have a biblical, a valid biblical interpretation that doesn't require them to believe that the Bible requires them to believe in a flat earth. Now, if the Bible doesn't require it, then when you look at the evidence, the scientific evidence, there's no need to reinterpret anything based on what you already know is the truth, right? The Bible is, doesn't actually tell you what you should believe. The earth could be flat or it may not be flat. Maybe the Bible doesn't, cite, doesn't point us in either direction, in which case now you have physical evidence and you have an intellect that God has given us to be able to examine that evidence and come to conclusions uh, and since we don't have any particular bias from the Bible, we can look at that evidence and we can reasonably expect to come to rational conclusions about it. And the rational conclusion is the worth is not flat. Right? It just isn't. Right? There's, there's too much evidence that the world is a globe and there's very, very, very little evidence that the earth is flat. And so there's nothing wrong with concluding that the world is round. It doesn't matter that that there is an atheist evolutionary biologist out there who insists that the world is a globe, right? That, that doesn't matter, right? He could be right about that. <laughs> the Bible doesn't say he's wrong about that. So let's skip down here. As a large non-denominational ministry, we have, to be caref we have to carefully weigh the feelings of those who align themselves more closely to our positions. This is the very narrow path that young earth creationists have to tread. Uh, and oh, I should let, let's go back here real quick. You notice the authors, uh, Robert Carter, who's a biologist, geneticist, uh, creationist, right? Has a PhD. John Safardi also has a PhD, um, and they're two of the bigger names at Creation.com. Those two have taken a lot of flack, and I'm sure that part of the reason for this article, even though I don't mention it in here, is the abuse that they took when they took the position during the pandemic that um, that vaccines were good, right? That they were a gift from God and that we should be using it, not blindly, but there was enough evidence, right? That they were safe and they were effective. 
and that we should be using that tool. Um, they also took a position that we should also be taking some kind of mitigative measures to stop the spread of the disease because of how harmful it is. If that requires some kind of masking, right, that might require some kind of social distancing at times. They weren't radical about it. They weren't saying like, you know, they agreed with every government, uh, you know, position on this matter. They're simply saying it's not a bad thing that we think about how to protect one another. And wow, the responses they got were just, just amazing, just amazing. Most of their audience, most of their young earth creationist audience comes from a background in which they have such incredible distrust for government, distrust of science now, that they were highly motivated to be anti-vax, anti-masking, anti whatever the government had to say, right? Running the opposite direction, falling into a bazillion different conspiracy theories surrounding different pandemic issues. Right. And so both Carter and Sephardi really experienced that really heavy pushback against them taking uh, those particular positions. And I think it really hurt uh, their particular ministry. Um, so they don't mention that in this particular article. They're kind of working with some other conspiracies, but I'm sure that's sort of in the back of their mind. As a non-denominational ministry, we have to be careful to weigh the feelings of those who align themselves more closely with our positions. Right. They are speaking to an audience that has a lot of different viewpoints and a lot of different, you know, interpretations of scripture, you know, an understanding on social issues. And so in general, what they say is this is why we generally avoid discussions of modes of baptism, end times, that's eschatology, uh, the roles of men and women in the church, like should women be able to preach or not? Uh, what Bible version should you use? You know, are we uh, King James only, or are we? Do we believe you can read the American Standard Version, uh, or is the is the NIV version? You know, is that you know from hell, or is that a good thing? You know, so it's like you, know, you can get to a lot of really strong debates about that. And they're saying like, that's those are issues we don't want to debate. We understand there's diversity among Christians about that. However, there is a limit to how much we're willing to accommodate. <laughs> it's like, it's like, we can accommodate a whole bunch of things that are differences of opinion among Christians about how to interpret certain doctrines, right? But more and more, we're often asked to comment on scientific and theological positions with which we strongly disagree. All right, we suspect that many of our detractors are trolls or other miscreants. In other words, we think that some people are just asking us to do that to try to get ourselves in trouble. You know, it's like actually the gotcha question, right? Like, hey, answer this really hard question because that I know that's going to get you in trouble if you answer it. Not that I actually care about the answer myself, right? And that's one thing that is, you know, in civil discourse in which you're trying to understand the other person's position and have it and, and really care about what the other person, how they feel, and you're trying to have a real conversation. You shouldn't be asking questions that are simply to try to highlight an issue with them and get them in trouble. Um, so they're right. That's what happens a lot. But there are really well-meaning young earth creationists who have real questions uh, and are really have really gone down some some bad side you know side trails, rabbit trails, right, and gotten off on a bunch of conspiracies. And creation ministry is international, just like Answers in Genesis. Is like uh, we can't we have a we have a responsibility to our audience right? Part of it's like our own fault, maybe, you know, we, we've created an environment which makes some of these conspiracy theories really enticing. But we know that they're wrong. So we do need to warn you about those. Sadly, we know that there are many Christians who actually do believe one or more of these things. Most of them are deep into conspiracy theory, and it's very difficult to reach a person that has fallen into that mindset, but there's always hope. All right, so same message as our other article. Hey, once you've gone down that far, it's pretty hard to get yourself out. Um, so how do you react, right? Due to slick marketing, it is sometimes difficult to immediately spot the errors in the presentation. Mm, yeah. yeah. Have you ever watched a uh, Calvin Smith uh, um, video on Answers in Genesis? Now that is some slick marketing. Everything from how he talks to the, the graphics and all that makes it sound like so obvious and so true. And yet he is so wrong. Right? And I don't mean... I mean, he's wrong about his interpretation, right? but it's more an interpretation. That he's just wrong about the facts. He is um, misrepresenting over so many things. Sounds so convincing, though. All right. Uh, 
sorry, I only mentioned because I just watched one of his videos. That's right on the top of my mind. All right, so how do we answer them? Like, how do we answer? And he's at, these two are exactly right. We wish there was a simple answer. There's no simple answer. It's not just like, hey, here's this one fact that will defeat them um, of how we're supposed to respond to these things. Of course, we do so in gentleness and respect when somebody genuinely is asking for the reason of hope in us. But sometimes we should, we should respond more sternly. In other words, not everybody actually desires to understand and learn or hear uh, truth. And so we have to just warn others about it. The difference is difficult to gauge, but when someone is lying, it's easier to call it. This is one reason why purveyors of these oddities speak the way they do. It makes it more difficult to untangle truth from fiction. If you truly want to refute them, you will be forced to do a lot of homework, and most people find this intimidating by design. Yes, conspiracy theorists often come with lots of data, lots of talking points, rapid fire, boom, 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 boom. And unless you have done all your research, you won't know among all that, what are the actual facts? Like some of their facts aren't even facts, right? They're, they're made up stuff. Um, sometimes they're combining information in ways that are inappropriate, but you won't know that unless you know all the background knowledge. So, so uh, somebody who's very skilled uh, at rhetoric can become can sound very convincing. There are different strategies one can use to engage people in debate. We don't have time to go through them. Um, and he goes on to a bunch of other examples. The conspiracy mindset. Uh, this is the same kind of thing with an answers in Genesis. Uh, we we want to we want to feel good about ourselves. We like the specialness of alternative theories. It makes us feel good. All right, but now he may ask this interesting question. But is not evolution itself a conspiracy? I mean, isn't that what it feels like creation scientists are saying? It sure feels like Ken Ham says that a lot. Right? There's a danger in rejecting evolution, but this we do not mean to indicate that evolution is right, but that if one doesn't reject it, they need to do so for the right reasons. Once someone comes to the conclusion that the majority of scientists in the world are wrong about something, the next obvious question is, what else are they wrong about? But this is not the right question. Instead, we should be asking, why are they wrong? And they're right about this, right? There's a false equivalency. It's like, and I, I see this argument all the time among young earth creationists, and they are, in a way, critique, criticizing young earth creationists here. Um, where young earth creationists will say, they'll try to say like, well, you know, scientists were wrong about this. You know, they used to th believe this and now they change their minds. Uh, so what else don't they understand or what else? They see, they change their minds. You can't believe anything else they say. All right. So they're not saying why like evolutionary theory is wrong. They're saying why something else is might have been wrong. And since they also believe that or change their minds about that, they could be wrong about that. And then he goes on to say, well, here's why evolutionary biology is wrong. And it's not because it's a conspiracy. Um, what's the fatal weakness of conspiracy theories? Several alternative theories unfairly or inaccurately pick on government bodies like NASA or the United Nations. But NASA is not a person. It's a government institution that employs thousands of people. We mentioned that earlier. It would be impossible to create a conspiracy of this scale and nature. And it would be impossible to maintain it in the face of many contrary witnesses. So if you have more than five people that have to hold a secret for, for dozens of years, <laughs> then, then you may need to abandon that conspiracy theory. Also, there have, also, there have always been hostile to the U.S. who would love to have disproved NASA's claims to have landed on the moon. At the height of the Cold War, the USSR desperately wanted to beat the US in the space race, yet they could not. Rather, they had to admit defeat. <laughs> Why did they admit defeat if there was evidence that it was faked? Why didn't they just say it was faked? Now, I can't help but comment here that we're living in an age today where, you know what, if, if, this ha if we went back to 1967, um, you know, there's certain people in a certain political party today that would simply, you know, if they didn't like it, they would just say it was fate. And they would just completely, well, what do we hear about all the time? Alternative facts. Well, that's your alternative fact. I don't really, you know, really think that, you know, that's your facts, but I have my facts. It's like secret information, right? Or that's fake news. You know, anytime you don't like something, that's fake news. So other governments, other people could say, well, that was fake news. Oh, well, phew. Look at all you reporters who are reporting on this. You know, you're in on it, right? 
you're faking it too. You're just part of fake news, trying to blind us to things. It's far worse today. Uh, but I do agree with the sentiment here, right? It's like, yeah, you know, if the if Russia had, you know, well, the USSR at the time had um, was in such really wanted to defeat the U.S. Why would they accept that the the fact that the fact I just said of the moon landing, right? Maybe because it was a fact. <laughs> it's like it was an undeniable fact. Many Christians, several of whom are friends and supporters of CMI, work for NASA. Also, the two board members for CMI are professional pilots for an international airline and both flew the military prior to that. In order not to trust groups like NASA or the airline industry, hundreds of thousands of people would have to be on the conspiracy. Some of our biggest friends would have to have been unapologetic liars. That's utter poppycock. And then talks about the nature of science and how science is self-reflective, self-correcting. Um, we can collect data, we can show people are wrong or right, and we have collected enough information to provide enough information to have no reasonable doubt, all right, that the Earth is round and that people have landed on Mars. All right, uh, the rest of this is kind of the, the regular boilerplate stuff that you would kind of expect. Um, I like this one, though. Over 2,000 years of scholarship. There is zero attestation to the most to most alternative beliefs through the entire Christian era. For example, if you search for the 2000 years of Christian tradition, you will be unable to find a significant scholar who believed the earth was flat. And note that these people could prove and note that people could prove the global shape of the earth long before NASA. If you want to hold to an alternative theory, you must reject your ancestors in the faith. Of course, if it must be done, if you feel absolutely do you have to believe that right then so be it but you had better get your ducks in a row first the burden of proof lies with you don't go around telling me i need to prove to you that the world is a globe don't go around telling me i have to prove to you that man landed on the moon and if i don't prove it to you if i don't spend all kinds of effort and i have all of my rationale in order, and I don't make any mistakes in my presentation, that you can then just reject me, right? You are under the burden to prove your case. And for me, most of the time that means I need you to convince, uh, for, for, for example, for young earth creationists, um, you know, I've had ones come to me and say, you know, they have their alternative understanding of young earth creationism. Right. They have a like a like a side, like a, a whole nother explanation for like how did organisms speciate than what most other young creationists believe. And they're like, they want me to take it seriously. They want me to convince me that I'm right of it. Now I say, like, first of all, I say to them, you need to convince your other fellow creationists of this. I mean, that's your closest audience. Those are the ones that have, at least you have a, a core set of beliefs you, that you share about the world being young and you're trying to support that. I'd say if you can't convince them of your theory about X, Y, and Z in young earth creationism, then don't come out to the rest of the world and expect them to suddenly change their mind. Right? So you got to convince those who are, have the most likelihood of being convinced first before you try to convince the rest of the world. And this is the way with young earth creationists in general, right? Um, in order to convince the world that the world is young and they've experienced a global flood, then you need to develop a really robust model for how the world could have been flooded and result in the different geographical features that it has today. Now, young earth creationists can't agree with each other about that, right? And there's significant disagreements there. As long as they have significant disagreements about that, um, they can't simply expect that the rest of the world simply falls in line with, oh, obviously the world is young and a global flood caused the geological features, the geographical features we have today. Right? You gotta, you gotta get, you gotta at least have a robust theory within your own community before you can expect that to then have any influence outside of that community. Yeah. So what's the challenge for those who you might be sitting on the fence? Well, did man land on the moon? Did they not land on the moon? Well, put on your thinking caps. Look at the evidence from both sides. Look at the way each side handles scripture. 
sometimes what we find is a lot of people with their conspiracy theory, they want to find some scriptural support, right? For Christians who have Christian related conspiracy theories, they're always going to want to try to go to the scripture and say like, oh, look, you know, this, the, this verse sounds like it's saying this. But maybe they won't provide the context. Maybe they won't tell you about the other 30 verses which don't support that particular interpretation. It's easier to interpret that verse in the context of all the other verses rather than take that one verse, have your own special interpretation, and then try to reinterpret all the rest of the Bible to fit that. So if you take a look at that and look at their arguments and realize that they are trying to push a, a square peg into a round hole, then that would be reason to reject that. Look at how each side understands fundamental processes involved. It's our contention that our alternative theory opponents are mishandling scripture and that they usually do not understand what they're talking about on fundamental scientific levels. Yes. Right. They might know one thing about the science, but they don't understand the big picture. The train of recent comments on our anti-flat earth and anti-geocentrism articles should make that clear. Right. They have Christians who are arguing with them about a flat earth and geocentricity. They're saying, like, look at their arguments. They don't make any sense from a scriptural and scientific standpoint. There is a rational viewpoint that is also a faithful viewpoint. If we take into account all the relevant scientific and scriptural data and savages, neither. Let the reader also note that we wait patiently for the quick judgment of God, as several detractors have warned us about. It's a humbling thing to know they will one day be judged and complete only with the blood of our Christ as our defense. All right, several of our detractors have warned us, hey, you're in for some judgment on your mishandling of our conspiracy theory. All right, hey, do you see this? Related articles, how to think, what not to think. Conspiracy and doomsayer scenario. Should Christians be worried? A flat earth and other nonsense. Apollo moon landing hoax on the face of Mars. Biblical history and the role of and so forth, all right? Arguments we think creationists should not use. Christian scientists have a lot of work to do. Now, they're not the only ones, of course, but they have to consistently be diligent to stave off the fringe elements in their followers who tend to stray far from the young earth uh, model and get into all these kind of crazy conspiracies. All right, that's it. Thanks for uh, hanging out with me. I know this was, this was a lot to go through, but I, it's very important this day and age to talk about how people fall into conspiracies and, and what makes them tick. Uh, and I think it's really interesting, this particular perspective coming from a group that many people have claimed or will say is itself a conspiracy theory um, of, of sorts, uh, and to see how they grapple with other conspiracy theories. All right, let's leave it there. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.